Got so it. welcome, welcome everyone. Just wanted to welcome everyone to our uh, November meetup. Um, uh, glad to see everyone. We have pretty good good participation, and hope some more can show. Uh, we won't have a meetup in December uh, for the holidays. We'll take a break then. Uh, just a reminder, also, we do have Salt Lake City DevOps Days is coming March 13th and 14th next year. We have a call for speakers. I think it just closed uh, just uh, on the 6th. But we may keep that open for a little bit longer. So I, I posted that in the chat. I'll repost it for some of you who came in a little later. Uh, if you've got a presentation or a workshop you think would be good for um, uh, the the community, please share. Uh, we are, our theme this year is DevOps is dead, evolving DevOps. So we kind of did a play on that where people said it's dead, but we all know we're still kind of doing the same thing. It's just always evolving and maybe the names change, but we're still calling it DevOps because we haven't come up with a better name. Um, but with that, uh, yeah, we are also always welcome for present presentations. We do this every month, uh, second Wednesday of the month, except, except December, we won't have one. But we are we do have openings in January, February, March, if anyone would like to present. If we have a local presentation, we usually can find a host that we'll, we can meet and buy pizza and everyone can mingle. Um, but we can also do these virtual ones, which is kind of good. We get lots of people out outside of the Salt Lake Valley and a little bit more participation. So, so with that, uh, we're, we'll we're the, turn the time over uh, to Richard and Bart. who are going to talk about uh, scale your stream, streaming your data pipelines efficiently in Kubernetes. And go ahead and start share your screen. We'll go from there. Okay. <clears throat> And I, I did say uh, if you if we have questions, you know you can uh, put them in the chat, and I'll I'll just kind of interrupt the presentation as it goes. And also we're open for pre uh, questions uh, the last ten minutes of the of the meeting. So, all yeah. right, okay, thanks, Brett. Um, so my name is uh, Rich Wood. Um, I uh, currently work for Bando HR as um, the software architect for AI applications. Um, I, I've worked uh, developing software for over 25 years. It's been a while. Um, I, I've spent most of my career building distributed systems. I uh, started out in FinTech with um, distributed automated trading systems. I worked in big data uh, with um, big data uh, distributed processing systems. Um, and now I'm working in AI. Uh, Bart, you wanna you wanna introduce yourself? Um sure, yeah. Uh so Bart Wood worked at uh um ExxonMobil, Goldman Sachs, Henry Shine, and now Qualtrics. Um, done a lot of stuff. Um, currently working on um, aggregating large data sets with AI. Been working on SAS Glue for several years. It's a neat technology. Um, happy to be here. Hello. Cool. So, uh, in addition to our day jobs, Bart and I uh, helped co found a, a company called SAS Glue, um, which is a software scheduling automation and orchestration service. We think it's pretty cool. Um, we're not gonna be talking about it tonight other, other than uh, this shameless plug. Um, tonight, we're gonna be talking about streaming data pipelines. Um, we're a pretty small group here, so uh, I don't mind uh, having this be a little bit interactive. Um, so uh, if, if you have a question or something, you can submit it in the chat. Um, or speak up. Um, I will try to monitor the chat. Uh, I'm going to be uh, doing the presentation, um, but Bart will be uh, answering questions in the chat. Um, okay, so uh, so streaming data pipeline. So I'm going to I'm going to introduce the subject um, and uh, discuss 
the pros and cons of a few general approaches. Um, then I'm going to show a demo of a working implementation of an architecture for streaming data pipelines that I've implemented in multiple production systems. Um, the demo code is in, is in a GitHub repo. So I will provide the link in the chat. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. So I don't forget. Um, so we'll go through the demo. Um, and then after the demo, I'm going to go through the code uh, and, and some of the deployment tools. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So uh, let's get started. So um, what, do, what do I mean by streaming data pipelines? Um, so it's sort of like a dictionary definition might be uh, streaming data pipelines enable continuous data ingestion, processing, and delivery, and are used to accelerate data delivery, real-time insights, and analytics. So what are some real-world examples of streaming data pipelines? Um, so one, one example would be real-time analytics, like a fraud detection pipeline. Um, I implemented one of these in my last job where uh, we we're looking at uh, people, it was for a, sort of a telecom company. And, and when people changed their phone numbers, it went through a fraud detection pipeline because there's a fraud scheme where people change your phone number to, to go to their phone and then they can sign up for all sorts of things with your mobile number. So anyway, um, that's an example. Uh, syncing data across multiple environments, like in a in an on-prem to cloud migration, or cloud to cloud migration, or a database migration. Basically, uh, any sort of migration is a great uh, use for that sort of a pipeline. Um, predictive analytics. You might have some uh, trigger uh, in an application. Um, that uh, spawns some sort of AI classification or um, generation task. So there's all sorts of things um, that we can do is, with uh, streaming data pipelines. Um, when, when we think about the, the goals of an architecture for implementing um, a streaming data pipeline, uh, some goals or some, some of the goals would include minimizing uh, your cloud compute cost. So the assumption here is that you're running this in the cloud. If it's not in the cloud, then this is not gonna be one of the goals. Um, but most of these things are running in the cloud. And if, if the system is not designed correctly, those cloud compute costs can get out of control very quickly. Um, so we also uh, want it to be fault tolerant, uh, to scale, and to perform according to whatever SLAs we have. Um, OK, so, so uh, all right. So a few alternative architectures that we could consider. Um, first of all, Kubernetes um, is a great way for uh, deploying these these sorts of things. Um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, you you understand how that works and how that would be a powerful tool. Um, specifically, when we think about scaling applications, we often uh, think about Kubernetes deployments um, scaled automatically with the horizontal pod autoscaler um, HPA. Um, the one, so we're going to, we're going to get into some detail on that architecture. Um, but the one that we're going to, that we're going to focus on, which is really good for workloads with certain characteristics that we're going to get into is, um, deploying sort of job, um, workers as Kubernetes jobs, uh, using message queues and a custom worker scaler. Um, so we're going to talk about that one in some detail and show a demo of that. Um, another framework that you could use would be Spark and Spark Streaming. I've implemented a, a lot of um, Spark uh, architectures 
Um, Spark is, is a really useful tool uh, when your data transformation logic requires processing data as a whole or in chunks. So if you're doing lots of transformations and then grouping and, and aggregating and that sort of thing, uh, Spark is, is a great job. There, there's a fair amount of overhead in spinning up a Spark cluster. Um, and so, so, so there's, there's a little bit more overhead with Spark compared to other tools. Obviously a Kubernetes cluster, there's, there's a lot of overhead um, in, in creating that, but a Kubernetes cluster is generally intended to be a lot more long lived um, than a Spark cluster. Now you can automate the process of spinning up a Spark cluster. So you, you can minimize the sort of, um, you know, manual work overhead of that. Um, but there's still a, a fair amount of overhead with just provisioning resources um, and getting the whole thing up and going. Um, something else that, that I don't love about Spark, um, it's, it's not very efficient for small data sets and it can be somewhat brittle. Um, you can have out of memory exceptions that sort of take your whole cluster down. Now there are ways of mitigating those kinds of risks, but, um, but it's a risk that you don't have to mitigate in other architectures. So um, now there are obviously many, many other ways of um, solving this problem. And I'm definitely not saying this is the way that you should definitely do this and this is the one tool um, but we just don't have time to look into all of the different ways um, that we could approach this um, okay so <clears throat> let's look at kubernetes deployments plus hpa um, so going left to right uh, we're going to have some sort of ingestion mechanism where data or requests or whatever are submitted to this um, system for processing. Um, now this, so uh, just sort of um, some uh, good sort of uses of this architecture would be uh, microservices um, or like a REST API that's backing up a web application. So you can imagine a request being submitted to those types of services. Um, now the, the request is going to come into a Kubernetes service, um, and that service is then going to, um, forward the request to one of us, of a set of pods, um, that are in a replica set that's controlled by a Kubernetes deployment, which is scaled by HPA. So this is a really great uh, um, architecture for workloads that are relatively steady, um, relatively predictable, and where the task duration is short. If, if you think about, um, it, you know, if, if this is fronted by a load balancer, right, or, you know, some sort of uh, um, web server, uh, usually the default timeout is going to be like 30 seconds. So um, if, and, and it's also generally a synchronous call. Um, so if it's going to take, you know, even getting close to 30 seconds to process a message, then this isn't going to be a great architecture. There, there's another problem though, with um, using this sort of architecture for long running tasks. And it has to do with the way the horizontal pod autoscaler works. So the horizontal pod autoscaler scales up and it scales down. Um, so the way that it scales down is it basically looks at the overall cluster utilization. And if in the aggregate, we have um, cluster utilization under a certain threshold, um, the HPA is going to start scaling the cluster down by sort of indiscriminately removing pods. 
Um, when HPA does that, it does not um, it does not differentiate between pods that are doing something and pods that are idle. So as it's scaling down, if you've just you know you've got a few pods that are idle. Um, I'm sorry, my dog needs help. Just a second. Sorry about that. Mom got home, so they need to go see mom. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, so as uh, so that so the HPA as it scales down, if you've just got a few idle pods and a lot of pods that are performing long running tasks, it's likely that the HPA is going to choose a scale down candidate that is doing something. So so when this happens. Um, you can configure your deployment to behave in one of two ways. One, you can say, okay, we're just going to kill the process and it will get scheduled on a different pod. That's fine, but it's not efficient. And you could have that long running process get, you know, move from pod to pod multiple times before it finally is completed. Um, the other way that you could configure your deployment is that um, that uh, the HPA would have to wait until the until the pod basically says, "Okay, I'm done doing what I'm doing. Now I'll shut down." Um, and if you configure it that way, then you can end up getting stuck trying to uh, scale down one pod that's busy when there are a whole bunch of idle pods that could be shut down immediately. Um, so, uh, so it's not very efficient. Um, so uh, let's move on and look at um, a different architecture for handling volatile workloads and workloads with long running tasks. Um, again, we've got some sort of data ingestion um, and we, we have a couple of options here. One option would be to put the payload directly in a message queue. Um, and this, this could be a good option depending on what your architecture looks like. If you need to authenticate or authorize submissions to this system, then you may want to use uh, an API uh, intake service. Um, which could handle your authentication and authorization. Um, and basically this service would be very lightweight. Um, it would take the request and um, maybe use a data store, submit the payload to a data store, and then um, publish uh, a message to a message queue with a reference to the item in the data store. Um, so scale wouldn't, wouldn't really be an issue. You could scale this just like any other web service because it is performing a very short task, which is just pushing the data um, to a queue, maybe a data store and returning probably a 202 um, to the requester. Um, yeah, depending on, so it, it may be that this requester wants a result back, right? In which case you could implement either uh, a poll approach where you know the requester periodically polls the service to say, hey, is it done? Is it done? Is it done? And when it is, then the intake service would return the result. Or you could use a callback URL that is maybe submitted to the intake service, probably with authentication information embedded in the URL, like a JWT token um, that, that um, the worker would then call when it's done processing the task. Um, so once we have a message in the message queue, um, we have this custom scaler that is monitoring the queue. And when it sees items in the queue, um, or, you know, a really old message in the queue, it says, okay, how many workers do we have? And do we need more workers in order to process this data in whatever SLA we have? Um, and if more workers are needed, it creates more workers by um, 
by using the Kubernetes API to create um, Kubernetes jobs. So a Kubernetes job basically starts up, performs some action, and then it goes away and whatever resources it was using get cleaned up automatically. Um, so what these jobs are gonna do is they're going to pull, mess pull messages from the queue and process them sequentially until there are no more messages in the queue. And then they're gonna shut down after some sort of uh, uh, grace period. Now, if you're, if you're running this in AWS EKS or GCP GKS, there's probably an Azure implementation for this as well. Um, you can run these or you can, you, you can have these jobs um, scheduled or targeted to manage node groups that automatically scale up and down. Um, and you can actually configure them to scale up from zero, zero nodes um, and down to zero nodes, which means you're not paying for any compute when you're not doing anything, which is really the goal of, um, of uh, you know, running efficiently in the cloud is to minimize that idle compute. Now, obviously you're gonna have some components that are running all the time that you're gonna be paying for, um, but they're pretty lightweight. And obviously, you know, we, we have to pay for some stuff, um, but this does allow us to minimize um, the idle compute that we're paying for. Um, okay, so uh, I think we're ready to get into the demo. Um, any questions or comments before we do that? Rich, I just, so from what you're saying of the two, two architectures, the second one sounds like it's, it's better equipped for you know, long running processes or, uh, or data streams that you don't know how long they're going to take to finish. Is that what that what you're kind of getting at? This one scales and can dynamically, uh, it, your job it doesn't get parsed around to different pods. It stays on the one job until it's completed, and is pretty economical if if it's not being used. Right? Is that exactly. Kind of idea? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and th there is one one assumption here um, that you'd have to check if you were going to be implementing this, and that is that um, the data can be processed asynchronously, so the requester doesn't need a synchronous response. Um, and then also, more importantly, that each data item can be processed independently, which allows us to have stateless workers that can you know, all spin up and, and process work in parallel. So. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, um, I was an associate software developer for like a year at a company um, and I'm no longer there. So I'm looking for my next software development job now, but I'm like early in the industry and, um, you know, I'm trying to learn all I can and um, here Kubernetes is good to learn about. I'm curious is like, so like for all the data that, you know, an organization that uses Kubernetes um, deals with, like um, whether you're like, you know, doing some get requests to see a bunch of user data or see all the data or doing like a post request to, or, or you know, having post requests done where uh, you're taking in data. Is like all this data processed through Kubernetes or is it usually just like, you know, some data that's processed through Kubernetes, or is it kind of, does that kind of vary from organization to organization? Yeah, it just depends on the organization. But um, so Kubernetes um, can be used to host a web application, like, like you're talking about where, you know, mm -hmm. people are posting to, you know, or, or that they're posting to, which is basically a data creation kind of thing or you know, getting data that already exists um, in a data store. Um, there's another use of Kubernetes, which is more kind of the focus of what we're talking about here, which is data production, right? Okay. So, um, so for example, like if you're, if you're doing like 
some sort of AI classification of data, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, like an ENPS survey, or for example, and um, you're you're classifying answers to ENPS surveys as you know positive or negative or suggestions mm -hmm. for improvement or things like that. And so you want to run run those through an ML process as they're produced, and then put the data back somewhere where it's accessible for those, you know, requests to a web application like you're talking about. Um, you could use an architecture like this um, that would get, you know, triggered when an ENPS survey is completed, for example, um, and it would get submitted to this process. It would go through the classification or whatever being done by one of these jobs mm -hmm. and then put somewhere where, um, you know, it's accessible to uh, to a web application, for example. Ah, OK, got it. That's uh, that helps. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any other questions? OK, cool. Um, all right, let's go on to the demo. OK, so what we're looking at here um, is the Kubernetes um, uh, sort of web UI. Um, and uh, this is for a Kubernetes cluster that I have running on my on my Mac with Docker, des Docker for desktop. Um, and currently, we have two pods that are running. One is the worker scaler, so this thing. Um, and the other is our message queue. And we're using RabbitMQ for the message queue. Um, so uh, here's the here's the RabbitMQ dashboard and or the web UI. So when messages are published uh, to this queue, we're going to see them showing up here. Then we're going to see the worker scaler creating a bunch of jobs um, to handle the work. So we'll see some messages show up here. Um, we'll see a bunch of jobs get created here. And then we're going to look at the logs of those jobs. And we're going to see that when they finish doing the processing, they're going to automatically shut themselves down. So first, I'm going to uh, run this publish messages script, which is going to put 200 messages in this queue. We can see a job got created for publishing the messages. Um, and now we've got 200 messages in the queue. So almost immediately, we start um, getting worker jobs that are being created by the worker scaler. So um, this is running on sort of a, um, a running at intervals, checking the queue, um, creating more workers if necessary. Uh, it's going to scale up to maybe five or six workers. So I'm going to let it scale up for a little bit. And then I'm going to run another script that I've written, which is going to tail the worker logs. And so what we can see here, um, these messages, I know it's going really fast, but it, you know you can see process message and this worker um, string here is the name of the worker doing the processing. And you can see that it's a bunch of different workers that are doing the processing. So what these workers are doing is they're pulling messages from RabbitMQ, um, which is load balancing the messages across all the workers. And they're just processing those messages sequentially. And they're set, they're set with a 20 second timeout period. So if they don't get any new work within 20 seconds, they're gonna, you know, print this message stopping worker due to max idle time exceeded. Um, and then they're automatically going to shut themselves down. And so we can see they've they've now all gone away. And we're back to um, uh, just our worker scaler and um, RabbitMQ running. So you can see how this is a really efficient architecture where, you know, these these workers spin up, do all the work, and then automatically spin down. So if we're running this in the cloud, um, there's a little bit more overhead for creating a new node. Um, 
but uh, so the initial spin up is going to take longer if if we're configured to scale down to zero and up from zero. Um, but it is going to accomplish the goal of of not paying for any idle compute. Um, any questions before we uh, take a look at the code repo? Okay, cool. Let's get into that. Um, so uh, if we just look at the readme file here really quick, um, it's actually really easy to get this set up. You just have to have Docker desktop running locally. And, um, and th there's some pretty simple instructions for uh, installation, clone the repo, build the Docker images, install the Helm charts publish some test messages, look at the logs. So there's scripts for all of these things. So you, you, should, you should be able to run this pretty quickly um, or install it and run it pretty quickly. Um, and there's some, there's some actually some pretty valuable code in here. Um, the worker code, uh, when it starts up, it calls this um, run function, uh, which is, uh, does some setup and then runs this loop. And, and it's basically continually checking, hey, should I, should I terminate? And if I should, then it shuts down gracefully, which means it finishes whatever it's doing, but prevents any new messages um, from, uh, from coming in. Um, there's a lot of RabbitMQ reconnect logic here, which if you've ever written stuff for RabbitMQ, that's a little tricky. <laughs> so, um, and so when this run function first starts, it's starting the RabbitMQ com consumer in a separate thread. And what this is doing is it's subscribing to a queue and it's providing a callback function, which gets called whenever a new message is received. Now, the work that it's actually doing is just sleeping for one second. So it's not really doing anything. It's a toy application, but you could have all sorts of logic in there. Um, and so it's printing out a message. And then, and then after the message has been processed, uh, it's, um, it's acknowledging the message. So while the item is being processed in RabbitMQ, it's in this unact state. So it can't be picked up by another uh, worker, but it's also um, still in the queue. So if that worker um, were to uh, be killed, um, you know, the pod gets destroyed or something like that, or it hard crashes or something, that message is gonna go back into the ready state and it's gonna get picked up by another worker. So when we talked about um, fault tolerance at the beginning, that's one of the ways that this uh, architecture allows us to um, achieve fault tolerance, be, you know, through the uh, through the message queue. So it, so there's another thread that gets started when the process runs, which um, uh, checks to see how long it's been since we have um, received a message by checking the current time against this last active time, which gets set up here when re we receive a message. And if it's been idle for more than uh, this configuration parameter, then it sets that terminating variable to true and the app application shuts down uh, gracefully. So that's the worker. Um, the worker scaler, uh, has, uh, so basically the worker scaler um, uh, has some logic that uh, runs on a loop. Um, wow. Yeah. Was there a question, anyone? I think you're good. Okay. So it's, and first it's getting the, um, the message count from the queue. The but then I'll come across and uh, and then it's getting um, the number of running workers. Now it's it's getting the number of running workers and also the number of pending workers. So the number of so the number of jobs that have been requested um, but have not 
actually been started that are pending. And we want to get that because um, if we have run out of resources on the cluster and we need to provision a new node, that process can take like 10 minutes or longer. So while that's happening, we don't want to um, you know, keep requesting more jobs because what we're gonna end up with is a whole lot more jobs than we need. And so we're gonna have a lot of churn um, and you know, provisioning and then deprovisioning resources that we don't need. Um, and so if we look at this function, um, it's going out and it's, it's getting a count of, and, and it's, it's calling the Kubernetes API to ultimately get a count of running and pending workers. Um, so, uh, so then it has some logic to check, okay, how many workers do we need? How many do we have? Do we have any really old messages? And if we need more workers, then it's gonna call this scale workers function um, which is going to iterate through the number of new workers that we need. And for each one, it's going to create a Kubernetes job object, um, which happens in this function here. Now, this doesn't cover all of the properties that, that Kubernetes jobs have, but it covers a lot of them, and it shows you basically how to implement it. Um, so if you needed to extend, extend this, it wouldn't be hard to do that. And once it creates this Kubernetes job object, it submits it to the Kubernetes API with this create namespace job function. And um, that's going to tell the Kubernetes API to create that job, um, as we saw. Um, so uh, we also have a pretty simple function for um, publishing messages to the queue. Um, and then we have a, a series of um, deployment artifacts, uh, a Docker file, which builds all of our um, Docker images and um, some Kubernetes artifacts. Uh, we have this Kubernetes YAML file which creates the um, RavenMQ publisher uh, and submits the, the messages to RavenMQ that we saw when we started the demo. Um, and it has uh, values for creating uh, the RavenMQ instance. Um, so it sets the password and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then a Helm chart for the worker scaler. And then all of the um, scripts that I mentioned before that install and, and run this whole thing. So, um, so if you didn't get anything else out of this demo, hopefully there are some, uh, there's some techniques um, for uh, accessing the Kubernetes API, creating Helm charts, installing uh, you know, Kubernetes uh, or creating Kubernetes artifacts with a YAML file and stuff like that. Um, so that uh, is going to do it um, for, uh, for the presentation. Um, so let's open it up for Q&A. Rich, you met, I'm, I was just looking at the readme. Would this, does this work on a Mac? M1 chip or the M series chips, or is it only on Intel? If you, know? you cross your fingers and knock on wood, it may work. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. At, at first, it was pretty rough um, with uh, the Bitnami charts on a Mac or, or on, yeah. a, on the ARM processor. Um, they've made a lot of progress there. I use a Mac M1 at my job. Um, this is running actually on a Mac Pro desktop. Um, so the Intel processor, but I've been having much better experiences on ARM with Docker and Kubernetes lately, so. Okay. But good question. Uh, Casey had a question uh, that I thought was a good question. What's the difference so in, in this processing and one geared toward stream processing? So um, this is actually um, a good architecture for stream processing, but it kind of depends on exactly 
um, what you mean by stream processing. Um, it, it can mean a lot of different things. So, um, so I don't know, Casey, can you uh, maybe give me a little more context for your question? Yeah, it was, uh, let me look back at the chat. It was kind of, um, it was Bart that was saying that this was, um, this was a, uh, a bit more geared towards batch processing and it seemed like it was, it was a stream process, oh, but I guess, I, I guess what I'm, I'm kind of wondering is what is the difference between the two and, and how is maybe Bart and you thinking about what stream processing is versus what's batch processing? Um, let, let me ask, let, let me respond to that. So it really depends on your, on your window of, of the data that you're pulling through. Right. And so, I mean, you can consider stream processing as a subset of batch processing, depending on how you define your windows. Right. Um, and so really, if you look at something like Apache flank, which is more streaming, it's, it's got so many options for those um, context windows of how you're pulling data, but it's not really relevant to the demo tonight. If you can figure out what your tumbling windows are for gathering data, um, that's the only real difference. So, because like like it it, it all depends on on what the use case is. So, it, okay, you're good. Cool. Sounds good. So. It is kind of a confusing topic sometimes because we've got streaming solutions like Kafka or Kinesis or some of those, and then you have messaging, and and really you could use both. I think so, the name shouldn't be used anymore because honestly, when I, I've used Kafka heavily and Rabbit, and they, I mean, their implementation is different. They both have lots of good pros and cons, but I mean, I would consider both of them giving me yeah. data when it's available so i don't know if i would call it streaming or batch so. yeah yeah and kafka um you know is a, is a great streaming architecture and you can do you can do all sorts of transformations um inside of kafka now as part of that streaming architecture um one thing that i'm not sure about but i have a very strong feeling that i know the answer to is how how it works when you have to scale up resources with Kafka. And I don't think that it works very well. I think you basically have to be provisioned to, you know, handle um, whatever workload you need to handle to meet SLA. So it, it's it not the consumer groups. So you can't reprovision the consumer groups easily. And you're kind of limited on that if you want um, in order to delivering that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you want to change the consumer groups, you basically have to like repartition, you know, all the data uh, in, in the queue, which sucks. It's a big, expensive, terrible thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. But not to say don't use Kafka. Like there's some, you know, great, great use uses for Kafka. Yeah. So in this architecture though, what would happen? How would you get past that? Uh, let's say RabbitMQ started falling over. How would you scale it up? Um, well, RabbitMQ can be clustered, um, but the use of RabbitMQ in, in this architecture is so light that if you're needing to scale up RabbitMQ, this is a, this is a big, big deal. Right. It, 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 it can happen. I've had that actually um, at my company where the payloads were way too big. So the payload sizes were way too big and Rabbit kept on getting knocked over. This doesn't really depend on Rabbit. It just depends on any any type of queuing system. It could be SQS with SMS or a bunch of other things. Um, the answer is, is that make sure your broker doesn't tip over. <laughs> and and also I didn't I didn't talk about this a lot um in the interest of time in, in the presentation, but if you notice in that diagram um where we had the intake service, um the intake service was publishing the payload to a data store and then only publishing a reference to the message in or the item in the data store in the queue. And yeah, that's that a lot with the problem bar mentioned. Yeah, totally. That that's a real good point. That's how you get around that. So good, good point, Rich. Okay, thanks. Yep. 
Um, but but also to come back to your question, RabbitMQ definitely can be clustered and scaled. It's I mean it's kind of a pain. I I would use like AMQP um, if I wanted to do that or AWS. You know, Elastic or manage, you meant AWS. AWS. M AWS for uh, MQ for RabbitMQ. That's what that's what you meant. So yep, yeah, yeah. That those services make it a lot easier. Yep. Or SQS is a good answer too. Yeah, yeah, that that can scale. Good. Yeah, I I was not a I was not an SQS fan, um, but I'm I'm currently implementing an architecture like this using SQS because it was sort of like a decision that came down from on high, so I had no choice. And I figured out how to mostly get around the things that I don't like about SQS. But the fundamental difference between SQS and RabbitMQ is SQS is connectionless, where RabbitMQ is connection oriented. So if your process is processing an SQS message and the process dies, SQS has no idea. So you have to play around with the message visibility in order to get that same sort of behavior, but it's it's not nearly as efficient as RabbitMQ that knows there's a connection there. And when the connection goes down, it just puts the message back in the queue. So is that kind of that acknowledgement process yeah. you were talking about that SQS doesn't handle that quite as easily? Now, SQS also has an acknowledgement process, right? That's how messages get deleted from the queue in SQS. The difference is that if your process dies, SQS doesn't know, right? Yeah. And so, but basically when the visibility timeout expires, it automatically goes back in the queue, which creates another problem with SQS, which is the same message delivered to multiple consumers that you have to think about and deal with. Mm, okay. Um, looks like Casey has a question. Yeah, this this is a really cool architecture. Um, I like the the idea of it. The do you have or does anyone on the call have some kind of some examples of maybe I don't know what you're doing at your job that a little bit that makes it a little bit more concrete in terms of like oh we're processing videos or like SMS messages or something um, and, and how you use this architecture in the real world? Yeah, yeah. I can I can answer that, Rich. Yeah, um, yeah So um, for uh, text analytics, um, you, you can get data from like, let's say you send out a survey um, to like a million people and then you get like a huge amount or you know 100 million people and you get a huge amount of responses and you want to you want to classify sentiment on that and you want to find out if people are generally pissed or happy or sad or something and so you want to run it through an ml al algorithm and you have a huge spike of um data flowing through and you want to process it as quickly as possible and so you have to run this text through an ai algorithm to generate sentiment one by one um, and so you can fan that out to lots of little workers. And so you don't want to lose anything. So you want to shove it through queues to make it more guaranteed delivery. Um, but you could have a, like a massive spike of, of data coming through. And this architecture will let you do a divide and conquer. So you'll be able to say, okay, well, instead of one process, looking at every, you know, sentences and going through an ML algorithm or something like ChatGPT to classify sentiment, you, you can fan it out into based on the queue back pressure. So, so you can start processing way more data and get way more throughput during that big spike. And then you can wind it right down afterwards. So that, that's a real world example that I see in my company every day. So. Yep, and at awesome. my company too, we've got a couple of different systems that you know do similar things with you know I I'm in I'm in AI now, so it's all doing AI processing, kind of like what Bart talked about. And so yeah, there's somebody somebody submits a survey like Bart said or something like that, and it gets submitted um, to this architecture for um, asynchronous processing. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks, guys. 
I have an, an example of that with with school testing where you know during the regular semester it's not a lot but everyone's taking their tests on the same day and we had a system in AWS that had this scaling problem that worked great until you know December when everyone all the all the the teachers would be testing at the same time and we had a scaling problem so this messaging solution in Kubernetes we did something similar a few years ago so this wasn't around then but it solved that problem because you don't get overrun uh, you can still process them and it can scale out but it can it won't get overrun and then the whole system collapses so everyone's a lot happier teachers are happy students are happy so I, I learned that from the hard way to that this is a good solution for these kinds of things messaging solutions and stuff yeah that's what we want happy customers another example I used to work for ancestry and we we process 10 million images a month and those images have to be OCR. They have to be resized to different sizes. And there's all kinds of things that need to happen. We have very similar architecture for that too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Do we have other questions for, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Oh yeah. I had a question. Um, I, um, yeah, I feel like I've uh, looking for kind of, you know, uh, associate level or entry level uh, software developer jobs. I feel like I've seen it like knowledge with uh, Kubernetes or Docker. You know, I've seen like maybe knowledge in those things on job descriptions, I feel like. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I was curious um, uh, maybe how much someone who's like a maybe entry level software developer or associate software developer, you know, for jobs that maybe require some knowledge on that, how much they should know about Docker and Kubernetes or Kubernetes or, um, or maybe if oftentimes in those types of roles, it's just uh, like, you know, you just want to be familiar with it and how it works. So I guess I'm curious if anybody has takes on that. So I, I would say that, um, that these tools are actually more, uh, uh, useful if you're looking for a job kind of in like the DevOps system engineering sy system architecture space. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my current role, we're sort of like a startup within a big company. And so, you know, we end up wearing multiple hats. Um, and so, you know, I've ended up, I've ended up using these technologies to architect solutions um where if i was you know if if we we're more part of the bigger organization as a software architect i probably wouldn't be doing this kind of thing other than you know helping to design the solution but not actually implementing it so um so yeah i i would say for a software developer job mm -hmm. like understanding that technology is is really good um mm -hmm because it gives you some context uh but i wouldn't say that you need that you would need to be able to actually implement i don't know that that's my opinion any other thoughts mm. from anyone else on that okay interesting thanks i would say that docker actually is probably useful to, to know but that's fairly straightforward to learn okay. only docker, and docker image true yeah except the part that's not as straightforward is how to build docker images securely <laughs> Mm. That, and that's that's probably that's more cool. DevOps anyways that would, that would do that I would think back to your point the DevOps you think would would be more uh, you think they'd be more involved with that personally yeah yeah it could be but yeah, just I think, ideas I think is good yeah I think Docker Docker desktop that you were showing because it now comes with Kubernetes it's a good place to start and where where it's really helpful as a developer like like the example here with RabbitMQ, and before you'd have to install it on your workstation and then play with it. The nice thing with Docker, same with databases, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, is being familiar to have that infrastructure set up so you can write your software and connect to those without having to set them up on your workstation. And it, it does take a little bit of work, but it gets you familiar with the what's the benefit of those. Um, mm. And then... Yeah, the, the things we're kind of talking about here with Kubernetes and Docker are, are DevOps type of topics. Uh, but 
software development is right there with it. So mm -hmm. I would say a lot of us, if you're older like me, you've started in software anyway. And as you've grown up and the cloud kind of took over, you find yourself doing more DevOps infrastructure stuff. One is because no one else did it. And so you kind of had to figure that out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And now I find I, I do a lot more of that than just pure software development, but huh. okay. it's all related. Yeah, and I, I and also figure that like some of these things uh, like Kubernetes and Docker are, are maybe just things that it would be maybe even normal to just learn on the job uh, in like an entry level job or associate um, level developer job. Like maybe there's jobs that like don't even really care about much about your knowledge in those things to get that job. I don't know. Um, and and it's more about learning it on the job. But I don't know. I guess I'm just trying to, uh, you know, learn the things. Uh, that you know I've, I've heard are good to learn you know before i would get like my next job i guess or at least just become familiar in the things that in in these things that would be good to be familiar and it sounds like i uh, would with um kubernetes or kubernetes it sounds like uh, maybe just being familiar with it is good rather than like being able to actually like use it um but it sounds like docker is something that is useful to know um so maybe i'll go deeper into docker and just kind of be somewhat familiar with kubernetes yeah as a developer i can run my, my entire system on on docker and like docker compose or something like that so i can run my database various databases my code maybe multiple multiple services at, at once and it's really easy to do that on just my own machine uh, okay so that was using docker you said as a developer docker and docker compose it for that yeah, okay Huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm kind of the same. Before, I'll, often I'll set it up for other developers, and then it's pretty easy or much easier to then if it works in Docker and Docker Compose, then putting it in Kubernetes is is pretty straightforward from there. But proof of concept, often I'll just do in in Docker, build the images, and it also is good to do, show other developers. Okay, here's this, here's our new art, here's our new stack, and use Docker to do it, and then they can just focus on their coding for the microservice that they're working on. Is that, is Docker kind of like for infrastructure and like these images are kind of like, like VMs in a way, I guess, or do I have that wrong? Docker, you can think of as just like a, a mini, a mini single purpose um, computer. Mm. Um, and so you can write an application that runs in a Docker image. And the great thing about, Docker images is how portable they are, mm -hmm. right? So you can you can run them in Kubernetes. You could run them with, you know, uh, on you know your local machine. I mean, so um, it also controls the environment, right? So like mm -hmm. if you were just running a program or a script on your computer and then you were deploying it to another machine. Well, you don't know what that environment looks like. You don't know what packages are installed, you know, if it's Node.js mm -hmm. or Python or something. Um, so when you build that application into a Docker image, you control that environment because it's all contained in that Docker image. So th there's mm -hmm. a lot of really, really cool things about Docker. Interesting. Okay, cool. Good to know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Your question: A container, Docker container, is like a doc, like a VM, just lighter weight. It's okay. Just, yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, got it. Casey, you had a, your hand up. Yeah this this conversation has sparked a question for me in terms of um, the separation. There, I think, is an interesting one. Uh, that there's new developers and like if we're in DevOps um, and we were to build this um, this thing that you demoed um, I know that like platform engineering is kind of the new thing right the new hotness in terms of like building platforms how how would you make this this architecture of you know a queue and an auto scaler with jobs and an ingress, something that like each, each team could use this architecture is, are, are there some things to consider when doing that? 
so that's kind of what we're doing at, at my current company. Um, now, this is within the context of, of a team. Um, if you wanted to create like a, a, you know, platform that could be used by anybody, um, I, you know, to deploy some application, I, I think, you know, you could do that, that the issues that you're going to run into are just going to be all the issues that come with like starting a business. Um, but basically, you know, once, once you have this architecture in place, um, if you have a good wrapper uh, for your sort of workers, um, then you can, then for people to be able to write processes to, um, to run in this kind of environment, they just sort of need to, um, you know, implement that worker wrapper, right? Um, and, uh, you know, create a Docker image, register it, you know, go through the configuration stuff, um, and, then it, and then it's pretty easy to, to deploy from there. So like for our company, we wanna make it really easy uh, to create all sorts of different um, analytic applications that are going to run in this environment. And so we've done that by, you know, creating, you know, wrappers, creating the whole infrastructure so that developers and data scientists can focus just on the logic of the AI processing. And then we make deployment really easy. So in that context, it is sort of a platform, but but more internal, not not like a commercial solution. Any other questions in the group? Well, good participation. I think those are all good questions. I you know I kind of had a I'm one of the organizers for Salt Lake City DevOps days, and that's one of my topics is how to get more people into DevOps because there's a lot of resources on how to be a developer and, and those kinds of things. And as you know, I talk with my kids that are, you know, kind of getting into this field, how do you get into DevOps? It is, there's not a lot of classes, you know, it's not a college course and doing it. So, and, and, and sadly, a lot of companies seem to only hire when you've got experience. So it's kind of the chicken or the egg problem. You learned it at a company and then uh, it's hard to, to move. It's hard to start, come in brand new, but there are some opportunities. We have talked about maybe doing more workshops, getting people you know, familiar with containers and Docker and, and uh, you know, taking maybe some, some sample applications and containerizing them and put them in a, in a Kubernetes environment. Um, I'm, I'm working on a small project like that right now, just to kind of help help train people in Kubernetes and monitoring and those kind of things. So look, we'll probably do some presentations that in the, in the next few months. So, but thanks Richard and Bart. Great, great presentation. Um, this is recorded. I'll, I'll get it posted up probably tonight. And uh, thanks again for everyone coming. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks everybody. Appreciate the uh, participation and questions and the feedback. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Um, have a have a good rest of your day. Yep. Yeah, thanks.